at the national level. The different departments that should collaborate to reshape the food systems and to ensure that they become more sustainable and poor poor all too often work according to separate agendas, thereby losing opportunities for synergies and multiplier effects. For example, ministries of health work uh, and they are concerned by the impacts of bad nutrition on public health, but they have no say on how agricultural policies are set. Ministries of Education try to develop school feeding programs, but they are unaware of how public procurement can be a tool to support local and agroecological agriculture. And when they are not captured by the large agro-export sector, Ministries of Agriculture may try to battle for small farmers, but in fact, they are not consulted when the trade ministry barters away much needed protections for the sake of raising the volumes of exports. At the local level, such inconsistencies across policy areas may be less frequent, but what does remain quite common is that the efforts done at the local level are not supported by appropriate national policies or by an adequate international environment. Municipalities and provinces, for example, may have excellent plans to link consumers to producers to use public procurement as a tool to encourage sustainable agriculture or to support farmer-to-farmer -farmer training or farmer field schools for the diffusion of agroecology, but they often stumble on obstacles, trade and investment policies, price volatility, the absence of flexibilities in public procurement schemes that are beyond their reach to change. Fourth and finally, promises are made, many of them, but very few are kept. All too often, commitments made at high-level meetings, recommendations adopted in reports, are forgotten as immediately as the delegates leave the scene. And while some parts of the government negotiate declarations under which they pledge to support family farming and promote sustainable modes of producing food, other parts of government find it difficult to resist making concessions in trade negotiations or standing firm against the demands of investors who offer to develop highly mechanized plantation-type farms on farmland that the government considers it is free to offer to the highest bidder. These four obstacles to the transformation of food systems are closely linked. But the fourth obstacle, the lack of accountability, appears to me today to a large extent to be a key to all the others. In the absence of strong accountability mechanisms, the political cost of doing little while promising much is close to zero. Without a real capacity for small-scale farmers to organize themselves, their bargaining position in the food chains will remain weak. They will continue to sell at wholesale prices to the buyer, acting as the gatekeeper to markets, while having to pay retail prices for whichever inputs they, they need. And their weakness as economic actors will result in their insignificance as political actors, because they do not count in the eyes of the policymakers, mostly biased towards export-led agriculture and industrialization, Small-scale farmers will not have the ability to influence policies that concern agricultural research and development or the regulation of agricultural markets. Accountability and empowerment are therefore key to achieve change in all the areas that matter to the ability for small-scale food producers to become more productive, to have better incomes, and to benefit from a market environment that is more responsive to their needs. The better they are organized into cooperatives and unions, the more they will be able to count economically as powerful actors in the food systems and as a political constituency that governments cannot afford to ignore. This will allow them in turn to influence decision making. It will allow them to ensure that investments in agriculture serve their needs rather than robbing them of the resources on which they depend and, it, it, and it, which it will allow them to um, ensure that trade policies shall not deprive them of their ability to live decently from farming and instead shall ensure their access to markets. Accountability and empowerment can unlock the possibilities for the kind of transition that we need. Indeed, 
No significant advance, I believe, can be achieved without them. Decision makers have largely co-opted the vocabulary and the slogans of the visionaries I was referring to who have been questioning the productivist paradigm in agricultural development since 30 years. But because the question of power has been sidelined, ignored at best, and often repressed, change has not really happened. Powerful words are found in solemn declarations, but actions, more often than not, have not followed upon these words. This failure to act is even less excusable now, because of the urgency, of course, but also because our understanding of what needs to be done has significantly improved over the past few years, and because alliances today have become possible. Alliances to unite different food movements and different groups, which were traditionally seen as having divergent or even opposed interests. The urban poor were seen as having an interest in cheap food at the expense of the rural areas who were taxed and cheated to satisfy the needs of cities. We have come to realize now that both groups have the same interest in local food systems that can at the same time increase farmers' incomes and ensure the provision of nutritious and adequate food at affordable prices to the urban consumers. The interests of the West or the North were seen as opposed to the interests of the rest or the South, as high levels of protection and subsidies in rich countries were denounced as obstacles to the growth of agriculture in the global South. We understand now that what matters is to allow each country, each region, to feed itself without destroying the ability of other countries or regions to do the same by dumping practices. And that what matters is that small farmers from all regions join together because they have a common interest in being protected from competition by large agri-food companies on their domestic markets. And this indeed is the main message of the global um, small farmers movement, the Via Campesina. We had thought that the interests of plantation workers were opposed to those of independent small farmers because each of these groups, after all, depend on a different type of farming. We see now that alliances between them are both possible and desirable based on their common interests in ensuring an adequate regulation of large commodity buyers and landowners and in a taxation scheme and a subsidy system that obliges plantation owners to internalize the social and environmental costs of their ways of producing food. And finally, we were in a situation in which the state was seen as a monolith to which the rural workers were necessarily opposed. We now have many examples of parliamentarians and local governments playing an important role in encouraging a shift towards another food system and in holding governments to account. The earlier barriers are falling. New alliances are being forged between the urban and the rural, within the rural world between farm workers and independent small food producers, between farmers from the north and farmers from the south, between actors of the food system who have been traditionally repressed and elements of the state who have often been absent until now from the formulation of food policies. However, alliances will only yield results if they go hand in hand with a reform of governance. In order to travel from our present situation to another point, where our modes of production and consumption will be truly sustainable, we need to adopt multi-year strategies that identify the range of measures that must be adopted in various policy areas with a clear timeline for action and an allocation of responsibilities across different branches of government. We will be unable to move towards sustainable food systems in which the human rights to adequate food is more fully realized if we remain hostages to the short-termism of markets and of electoral politics. The immediate expectations of shareholders and of voters cannot be ignored, of course, but the aspirations of citizens must be allowed to grow into something larger that recognizes our debt towards future generations and towards the most vulnerable segments of society. 
such multi-year national strategies should be participatory, co-designed between governments, unions, civil society organizations, farmers' organizations. Thus conceived, such binding multi-year strategies should not be seen as impoverishing democracy. Instead, they enrich it. Beyond the ritual of elections every four or five years, they enrich it into something more permanent and closer to the citizen. We will not succeed in introducing long-term thinking into politics by removing certain issues from democratic control. Instead, we will succeed in doing so by providing opportunities for citizens to invest into forms of civic involvement that allow them to contribute to shape the longer term. The adoption by participatory means of multi-year strategies for the realization of the right to food do not impoverish democracy, they enrich it. By linking the implementation of such strategies to appropriate indicators and benchmarks based on the components of the right to food, we can improve the monitoring of the choices made by policymakers. This can constitute a powerful incentive to integrate long-term considerations into decision-making and to effectively implement the roadmap that has been agreed upon. Indeed, such monitoring could be further strengthened by tasking independent bodies with this role. So such multi-year strategies for the realization of the right to food, together with independent monitoring of their adequate implementation, serve not only as a counterweight to the tendency of many decision makers to discount the future, they also are required to ensure continuity between different governments. And we will only be able to meet the challenge of moving towards sustainability if we do not make it um, an issue that pits the, the right against the left, the greens against the others. We must make this a cross-party concern based on a consensus across the whole of society. So this may sound slightly utopian, but let me say this. It's always been tempting for those benefiting from business as usual policies to dismiss as utopian proposals that are so far reaching that they seem revolutionary in nature and to dismiss the other proposals that are more modest as minor, insignificant, too modest to really make a difference. I believe we must move between this false opposition. What matters is not every single policy proposal considered in isolation. What matters is the full set, the range of actions that must be taken. And what matters is the pathway, the direction, the plan, the sequence of measures that piece by piece may lead to gradually making the right transition. Once set out in a multi-year strategy for the right to food, the set of measures that we need to adopt, toward, to, to adopt the move towards sustainable food systems cannot be so easily dismissed. What seems utopian now may actually be quite achievable if we see it as the end point of a long-term plan. And changes that may seem trivial and significant at first will be seen in a very different light once these changes are seen as part of a broader and more ambitious strategy. Our democracies are premised on the idea that even the greatest collective problems can be solved if we break them down piece by piece and address these pieces one by one. It is this idea that we must now reclaim. Thank you.